Covering music-related content of all genres, if it filters through Eastern Texas, it's fair game. Y'all bring it. From Texas, Canada down to the coast, and Dallas down to Houston, and everything in between, we are ETX Ross. <laughs> This is Katie Kennedy, the owner of the Liberty Bell, located in historic downtown Nacogdoches. We would like to invite you to come on down for our live music, our extensive menu, including our brunch menu, available on the weekends, and excellent service. We're open every day of the week except for Monday. We've got live music every day and drink specials. So we'd love to see you in Nacogdoches. Come on down. Tell them Katie sent you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another brand new episode of the ETX Rocks podcast with yours truly, Boston Chris. I've been told that I cannot say the word here during this episode by the lovely producer of ETX Rocks and my girlfriend, Louise Joy Leone, who is also going to help us co-host this great episode along with Honeycutt Slim, the one and only Nathan Honeycutt. So this is going to be kind of a, a roundtable discussion slash interview uh, with a very good friend of ours uh, who's also a member of one of the top five finalists for the 2016 East Texas Rock Band of the Year, uh, known as the Gypsy Creek Band. We're sitting here with the one and only Mr. David McCarty. Say hello. Hello. So David hey. McCarty is a member, uh, I guess, rhythm and lead guitar with Gypsy Creek. Yes. So who else is in this band? Uh, we have George Copeland, who is pretty much the leader of our band. He's uh, played some amazing guitar, and he's an awesome vocalist as well. I agree. And I just kind of jump in there and do whatever I need to do to, to back George up, you know, whatever it calls for. And, and you guys have a drummer and a bassist as well. Our uh, drummer is Manny Bell now, and Tommy John's an original member. Is, is on base. It's on the base, right? yes. So you're from Louisiana, right? I am. So what part of Louisiana are you from? I was born and raised in Alexandria, Louisiana. Wow, so like South Central exactly Louisiana? Exactly in the central. Yeah. South Central LA. In the center. South Central LA. So that makes you yeah. like a gangbang. <laughs> Not exactly, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess you, you got started real early in life, uh, around 11 years old. You got your first guitar. I did. And you had nobody to teach you, so uh, what was that process like? Uh, it was it was long to be honest because my dad happened to know three guitar chords, and he's a big fan of Johnny Cash, so that's what got me rolling was three chords from him and listening to his Johnny Cash records and trying to play along. And of course, you know this was probably back in what the '60s or '70s. It was back there. Yeah. So this was pre YouTube, pre technology. None of that. You know, you had to basically teach yourself by ear how to play this instrument, right? That, yeah, ear and a record player was all I had. Yeah, yeah. And so, it takes a little longer, I think, that way. But uh, I think maybe it's uh, it pays off in the end. Oh, I agree for sure. Well, why were you so determined to learn guitar, you know, coming up in a household where your dad didn't really play? I, I don't know if I can honestly answer that. There's something inside of you that, I don't know, once you actually learn something and do something that sounds good, I think you become hooked forever. And so was it just guitar that you were interested in or did you ever like branch out into other instruments as well? I've learned a little bit on a few other instruments, but guitar has been my main thing all along. Uh, what really got me interested in the first place was at church at a Wednesday, Wednesday night singing, and they had a bass and a set of drums. And I just heard that live music, and I was like, man, that's that's just unbelievable. You know, and this was it back, blew my yeah, mind. Before you I were was a teenager. child, yeah, yeah. Yeah, way before, well before I got my first guitar. So this was in church? Yes. Wow. It's yeah. amazing how many musicians hear something in church and are inspired by it and make something of it. Yeah. Some yeah. of the greatest singers in the world. Yeah. That's where they sure. started. So when did you first play in a band? Uh, I was probably in my early 20s and I was working offshore in South Louisiana, out in the Gulf. And I met a guy that was a drummer and uh, he was associated with this Cajun band. He invited me to come play with him. And so I did, and that was kind of odd. I mean, Cajun music is 
is not real difficult music to play, and I was able to pull that off. But the thing was, uh, the drummer and I spoke English, and the drummer spoke French, and the rest of the band only spoke French. So, wow. he, so he would just point to me and go, get in G. And uh, that's, <laughs> that's, all the, that's all the input I had on what we were, were doing. Were you interested you know? in Cajun so, music too? Or? I love Cajun music because it was uh, part of my life coming up. And Zydeco in particular, because it had that yeah. snap to it, you know. And so, yeah, that's been a big influence in my life. All right, so you started off with a Cajun band, but you've played in several different genres between then and now. Um, does that mean when you when you change bands or when you change genres, do you have to change your personal style? Or do you just tap into that diversity, whether you're playing Cajun, country, or rock? I would say a little bit of both. I mean, yeah, you have to tap into what, what you're doing. You have to focus in a certain direction. But um, it all comes from the same place, you know. So. so you'd say, like, maybe that Cajun flavor that you started with still affects the music that you play now when you're playing with a blues band that you kind of oh sure have a that, bit of matter of fact cajun, cajun music and the blues are closely related as well as a uh, country so, all kind of first cousins just not in french yeah <laughs> all right so you took a break from music when your son was born yeah that was later on in life uh i had been playing music i came to east texas and i uh there were some people looking to form a country band and uh they wound up picking me as a guitarist and uh, we had a really nice run here. We played all the best venues back then, which were up and down Highway 80 in Longview. Right. You know? And also back then they had house bands, which is something you don't see very much anymore. And uh, we were the house band at one place on Highway 80 for like a year and a half. Wow. We had a really good run there and we played six nights a week. Wow. So it was actually, you know, a, You'd actually make a living playing music then, yeah. which was something that, you know, meant a whole lot to me, just to be able to play music and do nothing else. So what brought you to Texas? Uh, work. There was a tragic accident offshore, and I don't tell too many people about this. I don't talk about this much. But... Uh, there was a helicopter crash, which was a helicopter that I was supposed to be on. Uh, my whole crew was killed, wow. but some of the guys that drove a little further, I let them take the first flight out because I, I was living in Lafayette, Louisiana at the time. I only had an hour drive. And so, so I was just being kind and letting them guys go out. And then when I went out there, there was no one there and just kind of. So you just, I don't know, it you just, just kind of freaked me out, and I thought, you know, maybe I need to find something else to do. And I landed a job up here in the steel mill, Lone Star Steel. So you went from offshore oil to steel. Yes, sir. And I guess uh, in a way, maybe you were just, you know, trying to not have to think about the um, situation, you know, the circumstances, the coincidences and of why you weren't on the helicopter or, or whatever. Do you think that had played a part in it? Oh, sure. It had a profound effect on me and... Sometimes it still does, you know. Oh, I can imagine. I can yeah. imagine. So. And it's kind of like the old Buddy Holly story where uh, uh, Waylon Jennings gave up his seat for uh, Big, Bopper. Big Bopper because yeah. Big yeah. Bopper wasn't feeling well. And uh, Waylon Jennings, who wasn't famous at the time, he was just playing in Buddy Holly's band, the right. Crickets. And, right. Um, he was a bass player. Right, right. At the time. Yeah, I mean, and of course, Waylon went on to be one of the most famous outlaw country stars of, in history. And, you know, had a, a huge hand in, in uh, finding uh, or discovering Loretta Lynn. Uh, little, a lot of people don't know, but Waylon Jennings was the first person, the first DJ to spin a Loretta Lynn record. Really? And that happened after that plane crash. I know he became a DJ at age 13. Yeah, and that's, right. Yeah, he was an amazing man. Yeah. So it's uh, so speaking of like people like Waylon Jennings and things like that, who are some of your musical inspirations or influences well, growing up? I came up with like Credence, Clearwater Revival, and later on Leonard Skinner and that Southern rock influence. And I, 
that's the direction I leaned, you know, for a long time. So kind of a like Southern rock vibe. That... Love the Jay Giles band, too. Yeah. Yeah. And did you have, um, like, Zydeco and Cajun influences, too, or is it just something oh, you learned on the fly? Yeah, Clifton Chenier and some of those greats, you know. Used to go see them. Cool. When I lived in South Louisiana, used to go see them a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's just, that's good stuff. Right. I love how you're all over the place. I know you're in a, you know, predominantly, I guess it's Southern rock, classic rock, a little bit of blues, some country. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you guys, you know, are all over the place and it all sounds great, of course. But, you know, you, you, you have to have members in the band that have a wide array of influences. And I mean, I've known right. you for a while. I had no right. idea you were from Louisiana, to be really? honest. But now a lot of things do make sense to me. Yeah, it's and, across the border, man. It's yeah, the right. Border. So. Well, we talked about the fact that you took a break from music when your son was born. Yes. Um, that was after playing country music yeah. for a while and being house band a couple of different places. That was about a three and a half, four year run. Yeah. Well, um, what made you decide to to put music kind of on the, the back burner? Oh, uh, it was just, uh, I was playing with different people at the time. I didn't really have a permanent type band, but I was still playing here and there with different people. But like I say, my, my son was born, my firstborn son, and, and, and that was important to me. And uh, I just thought it was a time to stay home for a while and not be, you Had know, focus, out and about all the time. Focus more Plus on Plus also, I, I was... I think I wanted to focus more on my job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, raising a family at that point. Well, how long were you out of the music oh, scene? Oh, wow. Do you know, roughly? <laughs> it, was a, it was a pretty good while there. Uh, I had, uh, one day I decided, you know, I'd had enough of that steel business. It was getting pretty crazy out there. And I packed up and moved to Arizona. And I was out there for about six and a half years. Wow. And uh, when I came back, I got in touch with my old friend Tommy Johns, whom I had met through some jam sessions up at Lake of the Pines. That used to be the place to be. On Sunday afternoon, they cooked and they had, uh, they had people come from Dallas and all over come to this little jam session at this little place on the lake. And it was a good time back then. And uh, we'd been doing that. And of course, when I went to Arizona, I missed all that. So when I came back, I got in touch with him and he invited me to a jam session at his home. What happened? And of course, that's where I met George Copeland. And you know the rest probably from there. Well, how did that develop, though, you know, going from just meeting somebody into turning that into a band with a distinct sound and a distinct style? Uh, it's, it's pretty odd because it, it almost happened instantly. I went to a jam session at Tommy's and, and there were a bunch of guitar. There was at least five guitar players that first time. Just a bunch of musicians, harmonica, you name it. People were just there having a good time jamming. But the next week when I went back, it was just Tommy and George, myself, and a drummer. And um, that was my first time to meet and play with George. And we probably played maybe for an hour, and George just looked at me and said, you know, this sounds pretty good. We should start a band. I was like, kind of like, duh, okay, <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> and we did. Whatever, and, man. Uh, it, right, and by the end of the night, we had uh, eight songs down, ready to go. And uh, within two weeks, we were booking. Wow. I mean, it just happened almost instantly. George and I clicked personality-wise, and even more important, we just clicked musically. Yeah. So, so all the time you took off, did you, were you still practicing and just Yeah, I still played. Playing you at, know. at home? And stuff? I still played. As a matter of fact, out in Arizona, I lived in a small town, and uh, I learned to play without a pick because I didn't have a pick. And so I've been playing all this time and kind of changed my style a little bit playing without a pick and i think you can hear that sometimes if you listen to the way i play right so you told us a little bit about how gypsy creek developed and who the members of the band are uh, how long has the band been around and what differences are there between the early years of the band and and now 
Well, uh, I think we're probably going on close to four years now. And like I say, it was just a matter of uh, two or three weeks from the time we met to the time we were playing. Right. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, we've certainly broadened our our song range mm -hmm. as well as certain styles. But also, uh, we've worked really hard to get a sound that is us. Right. I know you've heard us several Absolutely. times. And we do some songs. We don't do things spit shine like the record. Right. And we don't want to. Exactly. You know, we don't want to be like that. So many of them do that, and we just want to, we want our signature on what we do. And that's how we roll. And that's what we do. When you were talking about how you fit the band together and how you met George, and, and there were uh, several musicians that were out there, but something about you two playing together, you just seemed to know that there was a good fit. Um, I find that interesting as a listener and not a musician myself, because a lot of that we take for granted. Mm -hmm. I think the people that come to listen, because we don't realize what it takes to find a good fit and, mm -hmm. and how you know when somebody's the right person to play with. And, and when you meet that person and you play with them and say, yeah, we can take this and do something great with it versus, well, you know, we're, we're having a little fun here, right. but that's all this is going to be. It's almost like, trying to find relationships in yeah. other aspects of life. It, it's real similar, actually. That's an interesting point, but, but you're right on time. Uh, and I don't know, it's just one of those things that just happened and it happened instantly. And, you know, right now, George and I read each other's mind. We don't have to say a word on stage. I know what he wants to play next. You know, he never says a word. I know what song he wants to play next. And you did mention one thing that I, I thought was um worth pointing out again and that is that you know the gypsy creek stamp on things um having that unique sound that is all your own um I, you know if you go to a gypsy creek show and if you haven't out there and you're listening to this podcast i highly recommend um, a gypsy creek show and i'll tell you a little bit of background about that here in a minute but um when you do go to a gypsy creek show you're going to hear several different genres throughout the night, but everything you hear is going to be 100% Gypsy Creek. Um, every song they do, whether it's an original or not, has their signature sound on it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of bands in East Texas, and a lot of them do struggle with having a unique sound. And I know you guys probably struggle with it as well um, at, at times, maybe. But um, how important is it to you as an artist um, to, you know, I mean, you guys are predominantly a cover band. You do have some originals, mm -hmm. but as an artist, um, how important is it to you to kind of give that to an audience, that uniqueness day in and day out? I think it's the most important factor probably, to be honest, you know, because I think you can go anywhere and hear somebody that tries to play just like the record, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? And that's something we never tried to do. Right. We don't care to do. And it's cool because I mean, George, I mean, vocally, he's so, I mean, what's the word? He's so yeah, grassroots, man. Yeah, it's yeah. just, you know, it's just so organic. Mm -hmm. I guess that might be the yeah. best word for it. So unbelievably organic. And if you walked into the place and you saw George Copeland with his Gypsy Creek shirt on, you would never in a million years guess that he's the front man for a band. Mm -hmm. But then when he opens his mouth, you're just like... Oh, my goodness. He's a very strong vocalist. Oh, very strong. Yeah, and I mean, again, you know, <laughs> if you if you ever met George, you, you would never believe it. You know, because and then he starts singing and it's like, whoa, where did that come from? Right. You know, and did I know. Hear, did you hear some of the stuff that he does? You know, it's not on stage, but it's whenever. No, oh, I can imagine. It's just us. And, and he's yeah. a songwriter as well, right? Very good songwriter. Do you write songs as well with him? Not really. I try to help with the arrangements. Right. And that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, that's but, important, yeah, I'm too. Not, I'm not much of a songwriter, but uh, he is. Yeah. And he has several. So I guess maybe uh, we should uh, get to the brass tacks of why David McCarty is one of our best friends. And I'll try to... Um, Put as much background in this as, as I can. Am I in trouble? Oh, no. You, you could be. 
But it, it's interesting days. listening to your backstory and all the different things of how you got to Texas. And the fact remains that if anything had gone a little bit differently in David McCarty's life, chances are very real that Louise and I would have never met. And I will tell you guys a little bit about that. In May of 2015, I started a little group called East Texas Friends and Events. Yes. And a lot of people out there know about that group. Well, David McCarty was member number 67 yes. in that group. We're close to 16,000 now. So David awesome. McCarty was one of our, I would imagine you probably joined within the first hour that it was a group. Okay. Um, and of course, uh, I worked with your niece. Mm -hmm. at, at Walmart, That's uh, right. Sabrina, about that, yeah. and uh, she used to tell me about Gypsy Creek all the time uh, uh, when we were on break or whatever, and I'd be like, oh man, that's so cool to have an uncle in a rock band, and da 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 da, you know, I, I was just like, wow, that's awesome, and we started the group, and David and I started to get to know each other, and um, you being a night owl, and myself being a night owl, we were always up at the same times, mm -hmm. <laughs> always, I yeah, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> And just uh, wasting the hours away. Well, David McCarty comes up with the idea one night of possibly opening up group chats within the group and for different um, different reasons, whether it's yes. a musician group musician, chat or single, single yeah. Christian group. Maybe. And we, and we came up friendship. with all these different uh, group chats because of David's idea. And the first one we opened up was a single chat because yeah. you and I were both single at the time. And we were just like, hey, this is this might be a good idea. We can meet people. We can uh, you right. know, chit chat and all this. Right. Well, within a week of opening that group chat, we, you know, we were advertising within the group to try to get people to come in and chat and things like that. And Louise jumped in right. probably about a week after we started no, it. I was the first. I, I was remember. the third one in. Were you the third one in? It, yes. I remember <laughs> the story better than you do. All right. <laughs> take it away. <laughs> Your story you now. two were talking about starting the group chat, and so Boston had posted in the main group about it, and at first no one was biting. Right. And we at this point, test, right? at this point, yeah. it was just Boston and David. Mm -hmm. And I noticed it, and I had been single for a year and a half, and I hadn't even gone on a date with anybody during that time. And I'd been watching Boston on his group, and I wasn't really taking it too seriously, but he did catch my attention. So when they brought up the single chat, I was a little intrigued, so I, I threw in a comment saying I was kind of on the fence about joining a single chat. And he immediately messaged me, prying me for more information, <laughs> and convinced me this was a good idea. Yo, I guess it was in the long run. So we were the three to start. It definitely the, worked out okay. The group chat, the, the chat for the singles. And I was working with a newspaper at the time. So I was up at night. I was working at night. I was with, sitting, waiting around a lot at night with nothing but time on my hands and a phone. Yep, another night out. So the three of us spent quite a lot of time up at night just chatting back and forth, um, just getting to know each other. And... From that, it progressed into um, me getting to know Chris a lot more and us really seeing something in each other that we wanted to, to pursue something beyond that. And our first So date, where, where should our first date be? <laughs> this was a very tough decision, not really, this but was, where should it be? This, this was his decision. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't realize he was being so, so strategic but our first date, Slick. our Slick. first date Slick happened to be work. at a Gypsy Creek concert. That's right. Yes. Yep. I remember that well. And our very first dance was to Shards of a Broken Heart. No. Our first dance was not to Shards of a Broken Heart. That wasn't out yet. Wow. <laughs> it was problem. out. No, it wasn't. It Lay it wasn't. on. It was, was it Brown Eyed Girl? Yeah, I don't remember. I don't remember the words to the song. I just remember the man I was dancing with. That's yeah. what's important. So, right. so it wasn't Boston? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're still dancing with him. Yes. That's right. Yeah. And that is our favorite song, um, local or otherwise, Shards of a Broken Heart. Well, Dancing in the Rain with Darren Morris is real close to that as well. I'd say those we are probably... Have, I like that one too. Yeah. Well, we have several favorites at just with each style of music or each genre. Right. We have right. a favorite and definitely in that department, Shards of a Broken Heart is by far 
one of our favorite, definitely our favorite. All right, that's a great song. It is. And George wrote that, and he just threw it out at rehearsal one night, and we had it ready to go. And, and, and the song is so great minutes, because it, it sounds like a classic, you know. I mean, it sounds like a song that was written in the 70s. Yeah, you know? right. And you it guys bring flavor. it out, and it's a fairly new song, and you'd never yeah. guess it. Yeah. You know, it's just an awesome song. Um, yeah. Just so soulful. Yes. And George's vocals on that. that song, just, you know, it's almost haunting. And what, David's what guitar, to too. Yeah. Uh, Backs it up perfectly. With, with his white sneakers. Yeah. That he <laughs> always wears on stage. <laughs> anyway, you got to be comfy. But no, I'm glad y'all appreciate that song because it's, I love that song. And yeah. It has special meaning to me as well. You right. Know? Well, I mean, a lot of things, in order for Louise and I to be happy and find the person that we deserve, a lot of things had to break the right way. Mm -hmm. And you had a big role in that. And I know That's both cool. of us show you know appreciate you a lot for that. Uh, so I did want to thank you for that. And, yeah. you know, we yeah. thank you all the time for that. And you right. always, no, I had, I had nothing to do with that. Well, no, you yeah. did. You did, man, you did. You know, it was a good thing. It came out of a good time and, you know, good people. and Right. So, I'm, so I, I'm happy about it. I know that you're you're a fairly busy musician. Yes. Sir. Um, you know, you, you play at least once a week that I know of, sometimes twice, sometimes yeah, two, more than that. Yeah, two, three, but you're also a single father. I am. So, and I mean, what's he, almost a teenager or just about a teenager? He's 12. And, and I guess he's kind of famous in his own right with his, with his YouTube stuff. He's a computer whiz and he has stuff all over. He's a... Pretty much a computer genius. He blows my mind. Right. Uh, big in graphic design and stuff. So what's it like just because that's something else that you and I always had in common was the fact that we were both single dads mm -hmm. and we both had custody of our kids as well. Uh, so that was always something that, you know, you and I had in common as, as well as the music. Right. Um, I don't think people realize out there how many single fathers there are out there. Right. Um, sometimes the dads are the way to go, you know. Uh, well, I agree. Absolutely. Sometimes the dads are better. So, um, how difficult is it for you to um, to be that um, that mentor to your son, that that support system for your son, but also, you know, having this this night job with the, with the you know with the band? How, how do you balance the two? Uh, it's not much of a problem, simply because uh, he knows he comes first. Right. Always, mm -hmm. and because he loves my music so right. much, I mean he's the one pushing me out the door. Go, right. man, right. do good, you know. So I mean he's all about it. He's in the halls with band on the drum line as well. Right. So he has a strong interest in music. He's doing really well, and I'm so proud of him. That's really cool. And this kid, you know, he's very very smart and. Uh, he's turned a YouTube channel into a, a, a fairly big deal. Yeah. Um, and I know that you've been proud of even that. You know, how yeah. many parents would be proud of a of their child for, for making YouTube a thing? So yeah. that open-mindedness from you is, is really cool. I've always respected you for that as well. You have to support them in what they're good at. Right. Just like they, he would support me. Exactly. What I'm good at. And, and, and that's cool, too. You guys definitely you know support I mean? each other. Yes. You guys have anything else? That's important. They have nothing. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do our new segment, which is called Rapid Fire. Uh -oh. And as soon as we're done with Rapid Fire, we will talk about um, social media and where people can find Gypsy Creek mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. So this is how this works. There is one thing. So during this Rapid Fire, just, just from me, mm -hmm. I apologize for any questions <laughs> you have to answer right here so i just feel like i need to be nervous yeah. no reason to be nervous these will be simple and fun come on so this is rapid fire with david mccarty of <laughs> gypsy creek here we go number one stevie ray vaughn or Jimi hendrix stevie ray coke or pepsi coke what's harder being a single parent or playing in a rock and roll band Being a single parent. All right. Would you rather go to the bathroom with Elvis or would you rather be a kid at Michael Jackson's house? I think I'd rather go to the bathroom with Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> would, you, That's so tough. would you rather play lead guitar for Janis Joplin or would you rather hang out with Eric Clapton for a day? I'd rather hang out with Eric Clapton. Records or CDs? 
Man, that's kind of a toughie, but I think I like the longevity of CDs. Okay. Would you rather have a date with Elvira on a Halloween, or would you rather live out a Stephen King story? I think I'd go for the date, because the story's a little longer. <laughs> the date I could do in a few hours. Okay, so would you rather go on an Australian outback hike or an Alaskan cruise? I'm thinking the Alaskan cruise. All right. Would you rather win the Nobel Peace Prize or would you rather win $5 million? I'll go for the money, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is the important one. Very serious question. Would you rather hold a cobra or would you rather kiss Donald Trump's feet? Oh, gosh, damn, the cobra. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so that was Rapid Fire with David McCarty. David, where can people find Gypsy Creek out there? Man, we're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. Uh we're several places on Facebook and or on YouTube, I mean, and forgive me for the things that we didn't post. You know, people put stuff on YouTube of you all the time where they're filming right in the middle of a bunch of crowd noise. Right. You can't hear the music. It sounds horrible. And right. they post it and they think, it, you know. Yeah, you definitely and, have and to so, represent. But well. we do have some good stuff on YouTube. On Facebook, it's Gypsy Creek, one word. Mm -hmm. We'll get you to us. And... We always post where we're playing and what's going on with the band, mm -hmm. plus just some other interesting music stuff. We try to keep our page interesting. And you definitely do yeah. that. So you guys make sure you go out there and search on Facebook for Gypsy Creek, all one word. Uh, click that like button. You'll definitely be helping them out. Uh, and you'll find out where Gypsy Creek is playing. And I, again, I strongly implore everybody who's listening, go check them out. Make up your own mind on these guys. They're incredible. Uh, first time finalist for, for Rock Band of the Year here in 2016. Congratulations again on that. I know that surprised you guys. You yeah, weren't expecting did, that. That means, um, I guess, you know, that meant a lot to us. Yeah. And it, it's, it, it means somebody likes what you do. That's right. That's, that's right. right. And that's what matters. That's it's all fan nominated, fan voted. So that's why you do it. That's right. So. so you guys remember out there to keep on supporting your local music and... ETX Rocks. We are ETX Rocks. <laughs> <laughs>